Go, over to you guys. Thank you. Go. How's it going, guys? Good? Is this on? Are we, you're here? We're all here? Okay. Can't tell with screens and augmented and virtual reality. You never know. Here. <laughs> They're all holograms. Yeah, I'm Mitch, Tom, and Amber. <laughs> Um, we were just talking backstage about some of the topics we wanted to cover in thinking about influencers and how to influence the influencers. And we also thought it might be extra valuable for you guys to feedback a lot too. So we're going to do a ton of Q&A. If you have a question, even as we're going along, feel free to raise your hands and ask it. I will be scanning the audience. Um, and we'll leave time at the end too. Is that cool? Good? Yeah? Any pressing issues you'd like to bring forward before we get started? <laughs> Weather, heat, no, good, good, can't complain. Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks, Thanks for having us. So I thought where I'd love to start is maybe give perspective a little bit on what I call the sort of paid and organic influencer. Uh, you know, Tom, you and I were talking backstage and we were both like, oh, are we influencers? Because I know that I consider myself more, I think, and I don't like calling myself a thought leader, but I am sort of put in the thought leadership camp um, I do get paid to speak, to write. I also do a lot of my own, from, whether it's my podcast or otherwise. And I was actually thinking like, from my, my own perspective, like what it would take to influence me. But I'm wondering, like, how do you see the whole paid versus unpaid as, as, an, as an influencer? Me personally? I mean, uh, first of all, I think like, influencer marketing and the influencer economy is uh, it's fascinating to watch it grow over the years. And I have no problem with uh, influencers getting paid for what they do. I think it's, it's a new form of marketing and advertising. But I'm going to speak just to my own experience. Uh, you know, I, I think I happenstance stumbled upon becoming a thought leader yeah, or a, uh, 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 an influencer, mainly because I just have this crazy passion around au augmented reality, virtual reality, and wearable tech. I started writing about this uh, about five years ago when no one really even had a Fitbit or a Nike fuel band. Um, and so my, my following, I guess if you want to call it, my community became very organic. Um, and so I continue to uh, leverage my community in a very organic way. Um, and I, I always had in mind um, that the community that started to grow was really just my way of contributing to building this ecosystem necessary for the future. Because I believed that wearable technology is this next wave, I still do. Yeah. And in order for this to happen, I felt like we need to get into a room, we all need to get together, we gotta get on the same page. So let's have discussions, let's have meetings, let's have events, um, and uh, really wrap our minds around how we can make this future happen. And then if this future was to happen, then maybe I'll have a job in this. So that's kind of how this all started. And I think I, I haven't left that. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the influence that I have, but I use the influence to build the ecosystem. Um, and in building the ecosystem, then it, it helps me with the businesses that I do run, which is um, on the venture capitalist side, investing in companies that now have that support because right. the ecosystem's there, um, or the um, event business um, through the nonprofit that I am uh, part of called AWE, um, which uh, is a conference and expo and, and meetup uh, driven community. Uh, so my, my influencing, I would say, is, uh, is a way for me to be able to grow a community to help me with those other things that I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. Now, a Amber, you, you're even more interesting, because I think one well, of you... Well, that's not nice. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> not more interesting than Tom, more interesting as an influencer. She is more interesting than yeah. me, so... <laughs> I'll let Tom be the judge of that. Um, but, you know, anybody who lives in Canada or even abroad who's been following your career, and we've been friends for 10 plus years, I always was under the assumption like you're a journalist and you're a media person and you've been doing cr crazy work as a paid influencer and I'm always like wow like it's sometimes hard to tell like is that her being a paid influencer is that her doing media journalism so explain your situation uh, yeah so uh, I would probably never call myself a journalist um, I did go to journalism school and then for a very short period I was a technology journalist who uh, worked um, for City TV in Toronto. And then soon after, I went out on my own and started to do my own content. We do a lot of speaking. We're used to the mics not working. Yeah. Can we get Amber's mic up? Is, can you guys hear me or no? No. It's really quiet. It's yeah. quiet? Yeah. OK, I can talk louder until they fix the, the problems. Uh, yeah, so I would say that I am an accidental influencer. And uh, what I mean by that is similar to Tom's story, where I left my job as a journalist and I went into creating my own business uh, and I was speaking, writing books, I think more of a thought leader, but then I started getting approached by brands to work with them 
Uh, currently, I work with Google as an influencer, Nintendo, GE as well. And I think for me, I mean, it's fully disclosed as far as the work that I'm doing. And I would say more than anything, I'm a content creator. And as far as how those projects are funded, they're funded by many of those brands. So I think we're seeing more and more people who are in that space who maybe didn't set out to be an influencer, but who are doing work like that with brands. So the session's called Influencing the Influencers, and I'm wondering, is there a heavy line between, look, if you pay me, I'm an influencer for you, versus the other side of it? So let's start with the pay. Is it as cut and dry as if you pay someone, they will be an influencer for you, and that's smart? Well, you have to disclose either way. So even if you are just gifted something, you are expected to disclose that on social media, uh, and that's just part of rules and regulations in this country and the US as well. So I would say it's not necessarily a game anymore of unpaid or paid. I think disclosure is something that has to happen at every any level if you're gifted something. And I think also there's more acceptance around that than there's ever been as far as acknowledging that people are perhaps being gifted something or getting paid for something. It seems to be more the norm. Right. And one thing I just want to go back to our a previous question. I think for people that are hoping to become an influencer, in my opinion, the influencers that have the most I guess, uh, strength with their communities are these uh, passionate individuals that have a voice and opinion about a specific topic that they can't stop talking about, right? And so this idea of happenstancing into influencing is I think a common story you'll hear from uh, those influencers that just really feel like they have something to say because uh, something got stuck in their head and they can't seem to get off of it. Um, and then through the nature of just being loud <laughs> sure. sometimes and having something to say, they've created a following which then allows for a platform to be made where then uh, brands can access. You know so, what I mean? So lately, one of the things that surprised me, I want to stick a bit on disclosure because I think that's something mm -hmm. we all sort of talk about. It's like you have somebody who's using your product or talking about it. And it's like, do they need to disclose the fact that it was given to them free? You know, maybe yes. I think there's a bit of a maybe not so much, only because in, in very recent articles that have sort of dug deep into influencer marketing, in, in speaking to consumers, the word on the street is that consumers actually don't care anymore, which again, I was worried it's going to be like all of us being the olds. But apparently, the data and research, research shows that younger kids don't really care if you're being paid or not. They're just excited to see all this new crap from that person who's doing the influencing. So I'm wondering if this idea of even us talking about it and saying, you know, this is paid, this is unpaid, like, does anybody care? Well, actually, before we ask, raise your hands. Do you care? I'm curious, <laughs> raise your hands. What do you think? You care if, if someone's paid or not? So that's interesting. Look around. It's not that many people who actually are raising their hands. It's more than I thought, though. A is third? It? Yeah. OK. I what, wonder what why. Guys... Why do you care? That's what I want to know from the people. Yeah. But... I guess you can't all say it once, but let's talk about that. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that um, I think that disclosure has to happen, yeah. and I think that's where you build up trust in terms of the influencer who you're following. Uh, I can look at this from the perspective of my nine-year-old son. You know, he's following people who he trusts. And I think this is really important, whether you're the brand or the influencer, is that you are working together and there is an, a, an agreement that maybe that person isn't working with another brand in that category. And if they are, I think that's where you start to see the breakdown of trust with the audience. Uh, so I think that's what we're seeing with the influencer space right now. Is people may say that, oh, you know, uh, I, I do care because they don't want one day for me to be sitting there and promoting Google Home and the next day Amazon Alexa. The world just does not work like that. So you have to pick and choose and that's where you're able to maintain that trust and respect. So if somebody wants to work with, let's say you, Tom, or, or Amber as an influencer, how does it work? Like walk them through, I always say, I love eating sausage, but there are a lot of moments in time where I like to understand how the sausages are being made, the factory part of it. And that's, I think, what people here want to know. So if somebody wants to, like, how do they approach you? How does this work? What does it look like? Because a lot of times you get emails and they're, you know, delete, delete, delete. So sure. how, do you, how, do they, how do they break through? I mean, I think uh, for me, for example, it would come through my website or through social media that they were interested in working together. Then they would propose that they want me to post something on Instagram, and I would be like, ha ha, no, because I'm not, I don't do one-off posts. I'm really in the business of doing long-term partnerships, and that means I want to do cross-platform, uh, everything from social media to mainstream media, maybe some speaking at events. And so I'm really looking for long-term relationships. So the way that it would work is they would propose one thing. I try to stay away from those one-offs. 
and try to actually build a relationship that's more long term. Because if I start promoting a brand, the reality is for me is that if I you know, work with them for just a month, I can't go work with other people in that category. And I think that's pretty clear these days. So I try to build a, a longer term relationship. And Tom, talk a bit about whether it's for you, someone wants you to help them be an influencer for the AR, VR space, or talk about if you're working on something, you do a lot of events, and you want to get influencers to talk about it. Talk about it from both sides. Like, yeah. What do you do? How do you make it happen? Sure. I mean, I think if your job is an influencer, then I agree with uh, exactly what Amber's saying about disclosure and, and the working relationship. For me, because my job is not influencing, uh, like I'm not looking to get paid from being an influencer, and I, I don't get paid because I that's not my role as a thought leader. Um, getting on my radar is important, um, but I'm not doing you a favor. It genuinely has, it comes from my interest and my thesis, uh, my belief in, in, the, in the ecosystem. And if you fit within that and, and you excite me, um, then it might be something that I happen to include in my Twitter or my analysis of the, of the space or whatnot. Um, so I think there's, there's a little bit of a difference. Um, uh, like thought leadership and, and influencer, I think, is somewhat used interchangeably, but yeah. um, they are kind of two different things. Um, uh, they have the, the same impact some, sometimes, but they are a little bit different. Um, that being said, kind of on the flip side, engaging, yeah. engaging an influencer. So as, as you heard, I run a lot of conferences and, and events, um, including meetups. And I actually am, on the flip side, the client well, trying, to, trying to get the media attention, trying to gain the influencer's um, uh, a buy-in. And I think that the, the number one thing I feel uh, a lot of clients don't do is their homework when it comes to <laughs> understanding who an influencer is. Um, and so I think, I think it's in your best interest to find those people that are passionate about the space that is related to your target audience, that's yeah. speaking to your target audience, and then uh, to approach them and, um, and approach them with content, with products, with offerings that are um, almost feel organically aligned to who they are, um, which is why the disclosure is so important, actually, because the magic about influencing is, is that these individuals are media companies amongst them uh, on their own, and their media companies are so niched upon niched, right? That's the magic of influencing. So if you find somebody that's so well aligned to your product and your target audience, it's going to be the most effective marketing, uh, but you need to be able to make sure that that alignment is correct. And that's how you're going to get them on the hook. But yeah. the, and the disclosure isn't difficult. I mean, no. this is one of the frustrating things that I see in the world today is there are lots of people I know with bigger profiles than me sure. who you know are getting paid to post content. And and they're not disclosing it. But it's not difficult on Instagram to add a partner and tag them in that post. Yeah. And you can do the same thing on Facebook as far as handshaking and that that's an act of disclosure as well as far as saying that someone is paying for that content. But people just choose not to do it. And I think it really requires that everybody participates in that game. Well, do you think that they choose not to do it? Or do you think that there's something about the fact that over multiple years, these people have built up a platform and they don't want the perception that they can be bought and that right. they feel like that might damage their, like I used to always say that, you know, you can't really sell trust, right? Sure. It's like people come to me and if I say read this business book or check out this person on my podcast or check out this platform, I feel like I'm somewhat bulletproof because over the 15 plus years I've been doing this that I don't, I don't take money for that. So if I say it, it's from my heart, whether I got it for free or not, and I, I do worry that if I were to go down those types of roads, that it might dilute a little bit the perception that my community has of me. Right. Is that still? I mean, I would just say to go back to Tom's point, I mean, I, this is where the brands have to do their research. Uh, I had an experience last year where I reviewed an app called PicMonkey, which is a really great app to edit photos and do social media Are you images. Are um, Yes, I'm about to disclose okay. right now. <laughs> Very good point. We got about 200 people here. We don't but want an FCC I, I just, violation. Yeah, absolutely. I just love the app. I had been using it for a while. I reviewed it on the Marilyn Dennis show, and they approached me afterwards, and they asked me to sign a long-term partnership with them because they liked the work that I did, and I started working with them. So to me, that was a situation where they did their research. They knew that I authentically loved the right. product, and I've had that happen a lot, and I think those are the best relationships. Yeah. And I wanted to say two things from an influencer side, of, uh, especially as somebody who's uh, just watching the influencer yeah. space. 
space, uh, on Instagram especially. I think, and you can correct me if maybe I'm misstating this, but in the beginning with influencer, with influencers when this was just starting, it did feel, it was just too new to, to always say sponsored. Like you didn't yeah. really see a lot of it because it was kind of organic. Um, uh, but I think now that everybody knows that this is an economy, uh, it's almost expected. Like sometimes I go through the post and I see sponsored and I'm like, hell yeah, that person's getting paid for that post. They should get paid for that post. Look at their following, look at their influence. And so that's why I'm surprised with the third that raised your hand, that you, that you, were, that you were surprised that people are uh, disclosing uh, the fact that they're uh, they're selling things. And the second point I want to make is is around this authentic uh, this authentic um, I guess uh, promotion. Like you, like you just said, you came upon an app, yeah. nobody approached you, and then you gave them. Uh, I guess for all intents and purposes, promotion on the platforms that you have access to. That's kind of like when I was on Canada AM for a year doing the wearable tech segment, that's exactly how I worked on my side. I kept my segment all about what really enthused me according to my theme. And I think that a good influencer has a mix of those things that they come yeah. upon and then they, they, enter, they, they, they start to, if it's their job, um, start to make money from you know uh, some of the products that they mix in uh, with uh, with the rest of the segment that they're doing. Yeah. Uh, Is there any questions? That, does anyone want to ask anything now? I, we can keep going and keep jamming. Sp speak up. Stand up and speak up. Questions only. If it's going to be statements, I'm going to boot you out. Questions only. Okay. Okay, so the question was, uh, why is it okay for influencers to do this, and yet for journalists, it seems very sort of controversial if you took a product and wrote about it. Is that what your question is? No, it was more or less that the influencers struggle with this disclosure. But when journalists don't. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so influencers uh, are struggling with this issue of disclosure, and a third of the people here say, well, I want to know, and it would have influenced me, but people read magazines and newspapers all the time by journalists who are being paid to do what it is that do, and they accept that. So, so one is journalists are being paid by the publisher, not by the actual brand to do it usually, but I don't disagree with that. I was a music writer for many years, and even now with my podcast that I've been doing for forever with I do get a ton of books, and I don't disclose that I got those books for free or that I got that music for free or I attended that show for free. You sort of don't do that because I think, as a journalist, you fell under the umbrella of the publisher, that obviously there was some understanding that they get promotional items and things like that. But I think it's a really fair point. Uh, I couldn't agree more because the, the time that I did work as a tech journalist, which was just one year long, I got approached by one tech company um, who would give me stuff, who would want to fly me to their annual event. Press and I actually tur I turned They're it down yeah. because I felt uncomfortable because it was sort of kind of under the radar. I mean, I feel much more comfortable now saying, yes, I work with these companies and I love them. But especially in tech journalism, there is a lot of that happening where people are getting paid to go to events. They're getting wined all and dined time. in these five-star hotels. It happens all the time, no disclosure. Um, on the influencer side, I, I see people you know, making more of an effort in many right. cases. Although I'm noticing on the tech journalist side that uh, there's a yeah. little line at the bottom that is in italics that is starting to change That's that. Good. Not only that, um, what I'm seeing more and more of, which is aligned with that, is underneath the articles, you're seeing the actual publisher linking to an affiliate to purchase that. So they're actually making money off of it with this assumption that the publisher is managing it and that there's a bit of a church and state between the publisher and the journalist writing right. it. So I think the hybrids are really right. there. But traditionally in journalism, that's what we call an advertorial, right? So yeah. uh, it's, it is a little bit tricky there, but I think this whole notion of disclosure is important on either side. But I want to sure. go out, you were talking about the one-offs, and I think the one-offs are sort of where a lot of businesses, especially startups, find themselves. It's like, I've got this startup, I want people to talk about it, so I'm going to sprinkle this over five or six influencers, this person will tweet about it, this person will do an Instagram about it, and that'll help it pop. And you really can buy influencers and that impression as if you would buy a banner ad. So. What do you think of that? Like, I feel like we're sort of the holier-than-thou group up here. Like, we have to really love your product and do a deal versus everybody else who's like, I'll sell it for five bucks a tweet. 
I feel like that's just a short-term win. That would be my uh, stance really? on that. Is for many of them, I think it's a short-term win. Is yeah, you're going to get a spike in traffic, and you're going to perhaps get the reach that you wanted to get. But I think if you're looking for whether it's long-term sales or promotion of that, I think you can do more with working with a select group of people who truly love your product. I now I don't think that this applies necessarily in the beauty world as one example yeah, because there sure. are thousands of beauty yeah, products, right? Sure. In the tech world, if I go and endorse one smartphone maker, there are only like three or four others that I could potentially work with. So it's a different space. So I think it depends on the space, but uh, I think for the most part, uh, I think that that's kind of the situation. I was recently having uh, lunch with, with a VC and we were talking about influencer space and they were telling me that they are working with a product where it's some sort of herbal tea-ish, uh, you know, weight loss. Kim Kardashian, they give her a quarter of a million dollars for a post and they see literally half a million dollars in sales from that one post. Mm -hmm. So again, like I think you're right that in beauty and celebrity also, yeah. the yeah. economics and dynamics change at, at, a, at a crazy scale. Look who's on the front cover of Forbes. You were just bringing this up, Did you guys up, see this, right? by the way? The cover of Forbes this month? It's, uh, it's Kylie Jenner Kylie who's Jenner. on it. Who, by the way, apparently is a self-made billionaire, according to Forbes. I didn't know she was self-made, but... It's great. Yeah. But listen, I think it really uh -huh. depends on... I think it... I, th I can see where Amber's coming from, but I think it really depends on what your goals are at the end of the day. And uh, an influencer could be used as an ambassador or a celebrity, which this is like one. So that's where you want more of a relationship and it's a little bit long term. Or it can be used as a new ad platform. Um, and you know, my focus is in augmented reality and social media is just one step before we start wearing glasses that are smart that allow for all of us to be ad networks as we walk around in, in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely see how uh, um, your your reputation, your own influence can be leveraged as an ad network where I can force you know your, my logo on your T-shirt in, in real time bidding if I wanted to um, in the near future. So I think it really depends on your goals. So the other sort of divisiveness that I see in influencer marketing primarily is the idea of like how many, like it's sort of a numbers game, right? Like Amber can influence X amount of million of people. Mitch has got only a hundred thousand over here. Versus the other side, which is, well, if I want to get this sort of thinker at this business book author out, it's probably better to go to Mitch than to go to Amber. And those are the people who I feel are doing the work. But on the other side, there is this whole sort of numbers game, right? Like, sure. do you find yourself constantly in this place where not only are you trying to be the good spokesperson, but trying to amp up those numbers. Well, I will say I also have a business book out, so hopefully they would come to me as right. well. Right. But anyway, yeah. aside from that, that was a snarky one for the ladies yeah. in the audience. Uh, thank you. Thumbs but you don't up. do a business book author <laughs> podcast. I know, I'm just teasing you. About. I'm teasing you, Mitch. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think it's a really good point, and I would say more and more of at least what I'm doing, and I'm just one person in this space where there's a lot of people working, is that um, I'm trying to find a bit of a niche for myself, and that niche has been in doing broadcast media and digital. So many of the people that I'm working with, I'm actually here in Montreal doing a tour for Nintendo, so I'll do media and I'll do digital media for them. So I think it becomes a situation where, yeah, I don't have Kardashian numbers, but I'm able to fulfill that need as more of a, a micro-influencer in this smaller market. But do you feel yourself, as you're producing content, saying, like, i got to get my numbers up if I want to stay in this game where Nintendo and Google want to pay attention to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just, in terms of full disclosure, so I have a, a small digital marketing agency with my brother, and I pay $5,000 a month to, to my own agency to manage social media. And, and, you know, that may seem like a lot of money, but that's the game that I'm in because I can make it back with working with some of these brands. Yeah, so the other thing that came out, I want to talk about two news items, and then we'll turn it over to you guys. One was... Uh, Unilever came out and basically said that they're going to be banning the usage of any influencers that are paying for followers. And again, I thought that was one of those weird moments in influencer marketing that really shed a light on the space because I wonder how many people who are following people that they love realize that so many of them are actually just paying for fake followers, essentially. And I'm wondering what your take was when you heard that. I mean, to me, it's the same as buying junky traffic or, or <laughs> crappy ads. Like, it, it's, it's terrible, and you shouldn't do that if you're a brand, but. Yeah. I don't know, in my opinion, it kind of goes back to my point, which is the whole magic of influencing is the organic, authentic community that you have to influence. And so uh, I think the focus on vanity metrics is misguided. I think it's more about engagement. And I think we've seen a tremendous shift away from how many followers you have to how engaged your community is. I get that, Tom, um, but, and there's, so, there's, but there's... And so, no. buying, and so buying followers, is it's not going to... 
it's like a strategy to become an influencer, and I don't think you can become an influencer. I'm not sure. If you're a 23-year-old young person and you're a video game influencer or, or a makeup influencer, and you're seeing all these people come into the space and blow up and be huge, and you're seeing for a nominal fee you can sort of quietly but not so quietly bump up your numbers, I mean, you're trying to protect your business here. But they'll just get scraped out anyways in like two years. So it's, what's the, the, I guess what I'm trying to say is yes, I see a lot of people doing it because they want to become an influencer. Right. But you don't, it, I, I guess in some way, maybe in this new world, you can, that can be a job mm -hmm. uh, that you're, you're, you're trying to fulfill. But for the most part, uh, folks are growing their community organically. And those that grow their, their community organically, I think, are going to win out. That's my answer. Yeah, yeah I, I, could, I agree with you as well. And I will also say you get to a certain number on some of these platforms, and you can't avoid the fake followers. Because when I give yeah. my stats to some of my clients, you know, my top cities would be Toronto, uh, New York, uh, Vancouver, and Cairo. <laughs> um, I've never yeah. been to Egypt, Slovenia, uh, yeah. but I, you know, that's the reality. So sometimes I think it's hard to, when you get to a certain number to avoid um, attracting those bots and fake followers. And I know we talked earlier that Twitter and companies are trying to merge it or get rid of some of that following, but um, and, and you can attract it even if you didn't buy them in the first place. Right. On the other side, the gig feels harder to me than ever before because the algorithms, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, are more and more fill, so they're not showing all of the stuff we're doing. A lot of the platforms like Facebook are throttling our content. We have to pay to promote it. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about it as, as general content producers? I mean, I, I jokingly say that I feel that every day my blog dies a little bit more, and that if I'm not posting whatever I put there directly, not a link to it, but directly on Facebook or directly on LinkedIn, nobody will know that I'm alive anymore. And even that content, I have to pay to promote to get up there as someone who wants to have their content be influencing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a huge issue. I mean, I've seen the best engagement, to Tom's point, which I agree with in terms of many of these brands looking for engagement now. And to me, the best engagement, at least for me, is, is doing live streaming on Facebook as one example. I think doing Facebook yeah. Lives, we can see really um, big spikes in engagement. I think Facebook has even uh, talked about this as well. So I'm trying, trying to do more of those projects that allow for more engaging content. Because if I just post something on Instagram, yes, the algorithm will kind of kill it pretty quickly. So we've got about 10 minutes left. I've got one more question for them, and then I'm hoping to toss it over to you guys. So get your questions ready. Um, Isaac will run around with, with a mic. Last question is also very germane to the news, which was, Tom, you were mentioning to me earlier, and I was like, great story to talk about, is this Twitter locked scenario. So can you walk us through what's happening now? Because it impacted the stock. I think the stock dropped 7% when they announced it, because it's going to clear out some of these fake accounts, I'm guessing. So walk us through what the Twitter lock thing is and what's happening now. Yeah, I don't know if I have all the details, so I'm not an expert on it because I just read about it, but uh, you know, Twitter's you doing, Twitter, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm a Twitter oh, influencer. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, so Twitter is doing a huge purge, trying to get rid of bots. Um, so they're able to identify bots, um, what, but one of the category of users that they're not really sure about are, um, uh, are, are accounts that could be bots or could be real people. So what they do in that case is they lock the account and then send an email that is the email on file for the human to verify. And so if the human hasn't verified in a certain period of time, don't remember what it is, yeah. they're going to start to remove those followers from uh, Twitter accounts. So we fully expect to see some dip in Twitter followers across the board for people. Well, they're saying millions um, and millions and millions. Yeah, and, not... and, 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 and as, as Amber pointed out, it's, it's probably a big good thing because she doesn't have to worry about Cairo no more. It doesn't have to explain it, right? So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I think it would be but, great if they actually cleaned up some of these networks and right. they were able to do a better job of managing you know, what, what organic followers we actually have because it, it, it doesn't help the cause Yeah, and I agree with that. Again, the other side, though, that I see being a, a putting on my marketing hat is that I think some of the bigger brands who want to play with influencers want to show return with big numbers. And when a platform like Twitter talks about killing these big numbers, their stock takes a plunge. It looks like people aren't that active. And so is it one of those things where we look at it and go, well, it's good that like it's really transparent, or is it one of those things where it's sort of advertising, guys, and we want to sort of bump up these numbers and make it look good? Yeah, I'm, I think in Canada, I don't think there really are that many 
huge influencers like you have in the US. There right. are definitely some, but I think it's a different market in many ways. So I find at least some of the agencies that I've been working with, I think they're more realistic about what they're looking for as far as engagement, and they're not as worried about the fact that, okay, we want just massive influence. In fact, you know, micro-influencers, that's probably one of the fastest growing yeah. uh, markets out there, and that would be people with you know maybe 30,000 followers, and, and we're seeing that space where there's opportunity there as well. I think that's a, that's a huge point. So if you have a product and you're really looking to get it to market, I think you're better off finding 30 people, or if you've never read Kevin Krug's great article on a thousand true fans, definitely read that article. But that idea of like finding the 50 that really matter and knowing that they're real and trying to build rapport with them is going to take you as a startup a billion times further than trying to get that Kim Kardashian sort of nuclear explosion moment. So I saw there was somebody raising hands. Okay, great. So Isaac, can you get hot and run around? Thank you.